Luke 5, verse 36 till 39. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine, new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Welcome to the Post Mill Podcast, engaging the culture with God's justice with Scott and Pete. You've been drinking some new wine this morning? <laughs> no, not this early. Okay, well, it is a little early for that. Um, so welcome here. Welcome back to our podcast, our humble little podcast. We are now in officially season two, mm -hmm. and this will be episode two. Right. And uh, today what we're going to be dealing with or um, coming to terms with is a question, is the church or the modern evangelical church, is the modern evangelical church essentially secular? And uh, we're going to try to explore that without getting any hate mail. Um, I'm sure we will. And that's fine. Um, before we do that, though, we should... Uh, Oh, our we, sponsors. We should talk about our sponsors. Right. Uh, Circle V Leather. They make uh, leather products. All right. Show them, show them your stuff. We've got, uh, we've got leather welding gloves here. Okay, yeah. look at these beautiful TIG welding gloves. Super um, comfortable. Th these are pretty nice. They come right up to the elbow. That's yeah. pretty sweet. So you're not going to get your arms burned. Um, one other interesting thing here is, uh, I think it was designed to be a wallet. A front pocket a wallet. A front pocket yeah. wallet, but it actually works a lot better to be your uh, cold card wallet if you're a Bitcoiner. So mm -hmm. um, now, of course, Circle V Leather is growing and advancing into the new world uh, at very quick pace. And mm -hmm. we can make the announcement officially that Circle V Leather is going to be accepting Bitcoin as yeah. payments. As of right now, they just found that out right now <laughs> and beautiful. uh we'll make sure that they're all set up to to get that done yeah so. and uh bible binding oh. uh engraving everything nice goat skin really nice i think this is a company that's really going to take off mm -hmm. we're yeah. hoping so yeah yeah so so thank you for circle v leather for all the sound and video equipment and editing and everything yeah yeah that's good that's great okay so um we haven't uh, talked about this for a while, but I just wanted to talk about for just a couple minutes who we are, what we're doing. What okay. Are, who are we? Uh, just a couple of local yokels that um, evangelize, I guess, go out on the streets, preach the gospel. We have a uh, church at the soup kitchen that we started and uh, try to help people out like that. And we've got more things that we're getting into mm -hmm. slowly with some, uh, um, you know, getting people off of drugs and mm -hmm. alcohol, mm -hmm. some AA type stuff mm -hmm. we're slowly getting into now. And um, we, uh, through this podcast, we hope we can locally share what, what we're doing and then even um, these different type of ideas, especially in the situations we're in now in the culture. Yeah. Um, it's what we're talking about now is the church, right? It's shown itself to be non-effective mm -hmm. in many ways, in many ways, yeah. especially through this, uh, COVID situation and what we see happening on the streets mm -hmm. at the soup kitchen. So, um, we just want to help educate people, mm -hmm. just share what we've learned sure. and, and spread it around. Yeah, and I, I would say that we probably uh, fall outside of the, the mainstream uh, evangelical um, circles. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all been there. I think that uh, if you're in North America and you're a Christian, you've been involved heavily with the, um, with the evangelical church in various different degrees. And, uh, and over time, realizing that, uh, that many... Th well, asking the questions is that how... How biblical is a lot of what we do within the church, and um, 
And that a lot of the time as Christians, as individuals, like God has given us responsibility to actually uh, follow him uh, first and foremost. And I think a lot of the time as, as Christians, we actually pass over the Bible and we allow um, our knowledge and our learning to more be directed from a pulpit or a, a stage um, or from the culture. And how yeah. does the culture feel about uh, Christianity or how does the culture feel about what the, uh, the way to deal with the problems in the society is? And we don't really realize within the modern evangelical church that a lot of what we do is actually quite secular. So we're attempting to help look at a different perspective. We're always keeping God's law and God's word as the highest point yeah. of authority. And, uh, and that everything else works down from that. And if we don't start with God's word, with his decree, with his law, then we're really... Uh, a ship without a sail, rudderless, floating around on the ocean. Compassless, not not I think the, the key go. thing for us is um, not just Christian, but <clears throat> biblical Christian, mm -hmm. based on the Word of God, God's mm -hmm. law. And that's I think that's where the huge difference, if you take God's Word at its word, final authority, yeah. I think that will differentiate you from the vast majority of people that call themselves Christians that right. uh, <clears throat> don't, they just don't acknowledge the word of God as truth anymore. Yeah. And because it, it clashes with what, with what society is saying. Mm. And then when you compare it to the word of God, it doesn't make sense. You can always pull out texts. Yeah. That'll fit your narrative. It's yeah. easy enough to do. But if you take the complete word of God, um, you run into trouble. Yeah. Then you either have to go on the Bible or... Mm -hmm ignore it and try to carry on without yeah. which will lead to ruin yeah so i think that what we're trying to um to push everyone towards in their thinking is be a good berean uh you know paul yeah. showed up uh, in berea and he started preaching and the Bereans were like hold on a minute yeah let me just check the word okay validate it right exactly don't trust validate look in the bible exactly right? and uh, so we would say, you know, uh, keep an open mind, but also keep an open Bible. So if, if you're hearing something in this podcast or any other podcast that you might find um, uh, hurtful or conflicts with your belief, let's keep an open mind with that. Let's go to the Bible together yeah. and try to find what God's word, God's law is saying to us uh, in this time. Christ died so that we can be filled with the spirit of God and that we can then... Um, be in his kingdom following him uh, according to his word and you know that was the that's the goal isn't it to to teach others to obey him yeah right so so is the church or the modern evangelical church is it essential essentially secular okay so this um, idea I've been I've been thinking about this for a while now and uh, this has been something that's been on my mind and I've wanted to really uh, approach this topic uh, and, and look into it. But I read a book recently, it's another Stephen C. Perks short book called Baal Worship Ancient and Modern. So I definitely recommend having a look at that book. I will put a link, we will put a link in the description down below. Yeah. A lot of people online, they do this down below, down here. <laughs> Um, wherever everybody to, knows where it is it's down there don't somewhere have to show you but now right know that. with the subscribe button and all of that yeah. which we never tell people just on his do. website right yeah so you can Carter. go to the website and uh, you'll be able to um, download this book also if you go to reconstructionistradio.com you'll be able to search uh, for it in there as well and mm -hmm. actually have it as an audio book which is always very beneficial uh, narrated by Nathan F. Conkey who has a fantastic accent um, so anyway, I'm going to read a little section from his book and then we can see where we go from there. So in the book it says, It may seem truly astonishing to us that the people of Israel should fail to recognize their idolatry, that they should fall to a state in which they genuinely believe themselves to be worshiping God by practicing the Canaanite cults at the high places, and that good kings who sought to do right in the sight of Yahweh should be unable to do anything about this. Perhaps even themselves fail to recognize the problem fully. It seems so obvious to us that such idolatry is contrary to the true worship of God, 
But although it may seem obvious to us, it did not to most of the people in Israel at the time. And we must stop and think before we point the finger and ask ourselves whether we are, in our own way, in our own day, guilty of compromises just as serious as these, indeed whether, with the greater revelation that we have, or our own compromises are not in fact graver sins. The fact is that we recognize the idols and the sins of past ages and other cultures more readily than we do those of our own age and culture. This is why syncretism is so dangerous. We fail to recognize it for what it is and do so because we are so unwittingly committed to the worldview that characterizes our society and that produces such an idolatrous religion. This is just as true for us as it was for the ancient Israelites. Mm. What do you think about that? Uh, what is syncretism? Syncretism is um, is taking two, maybe even conflicting ideas, and melding them or welding them together mm -hmm. and becoming a, a new thing, a new entity. It's like synergism. Synergy. You have two mm -hmm. um, two people involved in salvation. Sure. So mm -hmm. this would be like there's two. <clears throat> opposing or not necessarily always opposing but there's two views right that make up one religion yeah so okay. when you have um something that's defined uh you know so for example christianity you must worship christ and then another religion comes along and says well you must worship well, let's say allah and then you can syncretize those two things together and come up with a new religion that's actually been done in syria and yeah. that's called um being an alawite Okay. Right. So um, so it happens. And I would say it most likely happens because there is a line of conflict between those two belief systems or ideologies that that uh, essentially each side take a truce and mm -hmm. they shake hands and say, all right, well, we're, we're going to stop fighting here. We'll just mix this together. Yeah. And, and this is the argument is is that we've done this in society, and that Christians have have or Christian churches have done this in yeah. many ways. It just makes you compatible with with society, then, right? Right. That's the same with you know the Jesus culture, where <clears throat> mm -hmm. Jesus is love, and he loves everybody, and right it doesn't matter who you are, what you think, or how you live your life. You know, right? So when you idea. hear someone saying something like that, you have to ask the question: Is that biblical? Or is that from a different religion? Do we have a mixture of a couple of religions that God is love? Yes, he is. Therefore, you must love everyone. And we'll define how that love needs to be. That would be That's not the hurting thing. their feelings, not saying anything to them that, would, that might cause them to think differently, um, not doing justice uh, for you know, like if they did something wrong, not punishing them appropriately or something like that. And, yeah. and then you can see actually, well, you've got secular humanism, right? Or humanism. And then you've got Christianity and we've mixed it together with this yeah. whole, like, this modern idea of God is love. Yeah. And I think the key, the key issue there is who defines right. love. Yeah. And you can say God is love and then define it yeah. from your secular worldview yeah. instead of going to scripture and say, yeah. What does that mean? God is yeah. love, you know? Yeah. So in, in, uh, he, he says that it seems so obvious to us, you know, that the Israelites were mixing religions there, right? That we look back and then he mentions that it's not so obvious if we're doing the same thing because we're living in it. Yes. So we might not even see it. Yes. It's I like the goldfish. The key it's like the goldfish in the goldfish bowl. Uh, doesn't realize that it's breathing water, like breathing water all day, mm -hmm. right? It's just its natural state. This is yeah. the, I need to be in this. And when it comes out of that wa water and into the air, obviously then it, um, it notices, right? But it's kind of like us in, in this society is that modern Christians don't realize that we swim in secular humanism all day. Yeah. And uh, we don't realize that actually our Christianity has, has, become def defiled by it in essence diluted diluted yeah. into yeah. it i think it would be important for us to define a couple terms here and i think there's two terms that i want to uh define is like religious and 
and then secular humanism, you know, making the contrast between Christianity and humanism. Um, because I think that this is now the, the biggest and most starkest contrast that we could even find in the Bible between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. We have all these other religions in the world in many ways they have elements that you could find potentially in the Bible, mm -hmm. but you have humanism, which essentially stands in defiance to the to true biblical Christianity. It's almost the the complete polar opposite. Well, it's like hum humanism comes out of Christianity, mm. right? Like mm. it's a former humanism doesn't really come out of sure like a Far East religion yeah. or a. It, right. It, it comes out of Christianity. So let's take look at a couple of definitions here. So defining religious. So this is just dictionary.com definition. So religious, what is being religious? So relating to or manifesting faithful devotion to an acknowledged ultimate reality or deity. Notice how it says ultimate reality. Yeah, that covers atheism even. It, it does. It absolutely covers atheism. And this is why it's important for us as we work down through these mm -hmm. definitions to, to help identify what secular truly means. Um, relating to or devoted to religious beliefs or observances or surreptitiously and conscientiously faithful to something. Okay, so that would be the definition of religious. And notice that God isn't always necessarily part of those definitions. He's not even mentioned in these definitions. Yeah, so just on the first one there, you know, a deity then is the only time he's really mentioned. The rest of the time, you could be religiously predisposed to a particular ideology. Yeah. Right, it, it underpins your worldview um, and you live your entire life out of it. Um, defining secular or secular humanism um, of or relating to the worldly or temporal. Okay, so that's really interesting. So we're trying to put the deity or the ideal to one side, and now we're just trying to squarely focus on what happens in this world mm -hmm. um, without God being involved or any other moral principles or anything. So not overtly or specifically religious, which I find uh, very uh, when you have when you talk about secular humanism i disagree with that very much but this is the secular definition and then the last one not ecclesiastical or clerical right so that's a little more accurate yeah yeah so secular humanism now wikipedia we don't we all just love to hate wikipedia because mm. it's taken over by um by leftists for the most part but you're probably going to get a pretty good definition of secular humanism from wikipedia so from the, uh, from the Wikipedia article, it says the meaning or phrase of secular humanism has evolved over time. The phrase has been used since at least the 1930s by Anglican priests. And in 1943, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, was reported as warning that the Christian tradition was in danger of being undermined by a secular humanism, which hoped to retain mm. Christian values without Christian faith, right? Um, so mm. this is very interesting because we have kept, or at least up until recently, we have kept many Christian values in our yeah. society, but we haven't acknowledged that those values come from Christ himself. Yeah. Um, and then secular humanism, often simply called humanism, is a philosophy of or life stance that embraces human reason, secular ethics, philosophical naturalism, while specifically rejecting religious dogma, supernaturalism, and superstition as the basis of morality and decision making. Okay, so um, secular humanism, again, is it, it's trying to not view the world through a spiritual or uh, through anything. That with sounds a like power a power less other than man itself. Yeah, that sounds like a definition where you just reject God. Mm. You know, they kind of say it in a nice way, especially with the, you know, basing morality on superstition. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah, that's a really odd definition because we base our morality on on what God says, mm -hmm. um, and that's not in there. That's that's a really humanism humanistic definition. Definitely. They, mm -hmm. re they refuse to acknowledge a God. 
even in their definitions. So, the unfortunately, the church has kind of ended up in the place that William Temple was afraid it would go. Right. So he said the Christian tradition was in danger of being undermined by a secular humanism, which hoped to retain Christian values without Christian faith. And I think that we're pretty much there um, for the most part within the modern evangelical church in the West, certainly in Britain, Canada, uh, in many ways in the States. I think that the States is an interesting, um, interesting country because you do have uh, um, a lot of Puritanism that is still uh, prevalent in, in the society, like the Puritan beliefs and stuff, mm -hmm. which really um, combat this kind of secularism. But uh, that we're essentially at a point within within the the church that we embrace reason um, in many ways secular ethics the church isn't ethically fighting as per what the god what god requires mm -hmm. but very much what the world says is is right and wrong no biblical standard yeah no standard yeah. uh no biblical standard and then philosophical naturalism uh while just putting to one side all dogmas, supernaturalism, superstitions, and also just making sure that your morality is essentially comes from your your conscience and then the collective group of consciences that make the culture. Yeah, society yeah, decides society. what mor is mor moral. moral. It, it's odd there that um, they don't really bring in science because mm. it seems to be that's where we've kind of gone now that like with evolution and mm -hmm. even in the healthcare now you know science is the ultimate authority right? yeah it's it has to be based on science otherwise it's it has no or, value or scientism or which yeah. is is a it both Christians and non-Christians, atheists, secular humanists, Muslims, everybody looks at the same data mm -hmm. when you do a scientific experiment. Everybody gets the same numbers, Yeah. right? But it's how you use your worldview to determine meaning from those numbers. Yeah. So your, your worldview, and you could call that your, your religious underpinnings, this is what you hold near and dear at your heart, um, determines what the outcome of those particular um, data points would be yeah. when you do science. So science is objective. It stands alone. Scientism, you know, happens to... So, for example, you might have someone that says, um, I presuppose and I'm already religiously given over to the idea that the world formed over billions of years and that um, the dinosaurs you know, either faded away or died in a meteor attack or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Martians came down and wiped them all out or something like that. I don't know. But then if you already have that idea that God just didn't, doesn't exist, there's nothing that God has to say about that particular event in history yeah. or the pre, you know, throughout history, that you come up with a different answer Right. And and it becomes an answer that is not based really on truth, but based on your sub presupposition using the data points that you've already identified. Whereas a Christian would say, well, we presuppose that the Lord created the, the world and that the dinosaurs got wiped out through a biblical flood, which yeah. was God judging sinful man in the world and, and, and doing something in the world. And, and then we would come up with a different potentially different yeah, and, answer to and you would look right. for evidences right. to support them theories yeah and and that's the that's the thing and then the problem is is when evidence doesn't point to your theory and you have to start fudging it right uh then you start getting into more of a religious yes. idea where you you refuse to acknowledge truth right you know and that that's uh that's where i think we run into trouble yeah it becomes a, a religion then yeah and not just a, a theory where you try to back it up with data right um because that's really happened with evolution mm -hmm. like there's so much evidence against mm -hmm. that theory mm -hmm. and i think we're seeing it now with the science of uh mm -hmm. covid vaccinations things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. yeah we're definitely into a realm of 
of craziness where if you don't have an anchor to tie yourself down to mm-hmm. in the storm, you're going to be tossed each and every which way. And as Christians, and actually as all people in the world, we understand that God's word is, is, the, is this anchor. Yeah. The Bible says is that the works of the law are written on all of our hearts, and this is our consciences. So even those who deny God have a conscience, and it's in many ways connected to the fact that they're made in the image of God, and that they have these these feelings that go along with that fact. So ethics and morality and all of these things, it's ridiculous to think that any of that is possible without a God. That it's not something that can be that can be evolved, right? Like mm-hmm. it's like that Jeff Durbin quote he says all the time: "So what, right? Yeah. Okay. So you came from a star exploding, and now you're just a bunch of skin, yeah, in the world, you know, brushing shoulders with a whole bunch of other skin in the world. Like, yeah, you've got no meaning. So what? Yeah, nothing matters. Right. Nothing. Nothing makes sense anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no. Uh, there's no value in right. anything even because you're just yeah molecules yeah so i think for the most part as within the within the church and just we want to get into defining um or, or finding some examples here um but before we kind of jump into the examples, I want to just say how the church has secularized and mixed with secular humanism over time. I think for for one, um, we've we were taken away by the whole idea of of uh, natural selection and the theory of evolution, which is still a theory; it's never been proven, um, and that that's undermined. Uh, a lot of how we view the world as Christians, and then, no. and what it led to, instead of the Christians trying to stand in the the culture, and this is going back a couple hundred years now. Yeah, uh, this is the entry point of this: is that instead of Christians trying to stand up against that and just showing, okay, actually, this is what what we would say in answer to that, we kind of backed off a lot from it, mm-hmm. and we went from being a people who understood that Christianity, or I should say faith in Christ and God's kingdom should be going all around the world to the ends of the earth. And of course it still has, Yeah. um, but just not in as an effective way as it had up until that point. So Jesus's kingdom, which we believe came 2000 years ago, right? When Christ came, yep. lived perfectly, died, rose again, and ascended and sat down at the right hand, that we're now in God's kingdom and that his kingdom goes out throughout the world in all spheres of life, right? That yes. God's law changes everything. It changes hearts. It changes societies. And then Christians go out to transform society. And this includes politics and the workplace and healthcare and education and everything, yep. right? And um, I think that we're into this this place now where the, the Christian church has actually essentially backed off and is waiting for Jesus to come back and has really stopped engaging the world. Definitely, yeah. That, that is for sure. <clears throat> there seems to be, like in the early church, that was a, a prime example, you know, how the church should be living and engaging the culture. Mm-hmm. And that lasted maybe, what, 300 years or so? And then when the church started taking control, right, and uh, you know started bringing in authority, popes, bishops, right, you know, and and centralizing, yeah, the whole idea. Um, that's that's where it went wrong. Yes, you know, to go to go way back because we were mentioning also talking about the uh, the leadership in the in the church has even become like Jesus says, you can't be an authority over other people like right. the Gentiles do. Yeah. You have to be a servant yeah. leader if yeah. you want to leave. And and that already is an error because it takes the re- responsibility away from the individual, like we right. talked about with sphere sovereignty. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's one man or one group of people that decides for us. 
Right. And we we tend to back off our responsibility then, you know. Right. And uh, I think that that was a big problem. And even the Reformation didn't really change that. It didn't go far enough mm. in that. And and we see what happens now. You yeah. have churches full of people that just want to be entertained in a sense, you know, yeah. told what to do. Yeah. Told what to believe even. Yeah without taking individual responsibility yeah, for that the bibles don't really get open so yeah. it's it's almost like it was all of all or nothing for the church when it came to responsibility now we talked about this in our last podcast episode sphere sovereignty yeah and what's the responsibility of the church and the responsibility of the church primarily is to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth and um it but you know if you go back 500 or a thousand years the church was doing that plus some yeah. So the church was putting people to death for quote unquote sins or crimes. Yeah. Whether they were sins or crimes or not. Yeah. Uh, whether they were or not isn't important. It's the fact that the church didn't have authority to do that. That the church was doing a whole bunch of things. So essentially the, the church had subsumed the state for the most part. And it was doing what the state should have been done. Yep. And again, the individual people didn't weren't able to have any responsibility themselves because the church did everything. Even even the church back then, like it was illegal to translate the Bible from Latin into the, the local languages because the church read the Bible to you. Yeah. And people didn't understand Latin. So the church literally did everything and it made it very... Um, it was illegal to read the Bible. Yeah. It, yeah it, and you it could was, die for that. Yes. And many people did. Yeah. And it was it was interesting because the church literally did everything. They did your faith for you. Yeah. Right. And I think there was a big uh, understanding that that wasn't right. And then we had what we call the Reformation came out of that, where actually the Reformation was more of an exodus, where yeah. a group of people, many people from many different churches and well, from the Catholic Church, but many different parts of the world came out yeah. and went a different direction. They cleaned up the theology. But now we're 500 plus years since that and we can see now that the church instead of doing everything the church does nothing exactly for the most part right? right the church isn't really involved in preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth if you if you think that you're going to send missionaries to uganda from your church which is already a christian nation but you're not going to send missionaries to the streets of your town to stand up for justice and to preach the gospel yeah. then um then I don't think you get it. No. Right? So we, we've gone the, the opposite way now. It, it's almost like we do stuff in the church, but we don't really know why we do it. You know, we know we have to do mission work, <clears throat> but we don't have an understanding right. of what that includes. And like you say, it, it mission has always been done in faraway countries. Yeah. But local mission is, is ignored. It, and it's odd. Because even like Bill was saying about the soup kitchen they have a hard time getting funds for the daily operation mm -hmm. and he sent letters to all the churches and only a few respond mm -hmm. and he said too it, it's the duty of the church to feed the poor right and take care of the homeless and and they're not interested mm -hmm. and it's society secular society that's doing the work of the church and yeah. and that in my view that blasphemes the name of christ right because the christians are not following Christ. Oh, I would say the churches aren't. And and because we have to be uh we have to recognize that there are many Christians mm -hmm. who understand the authority that God's given them and the responsibility that God's given them. So you yeah. do have many Christians showing up to do volunteering, volunteering the soup kitchen and, and other giving places money and giving money and stuff like yeah. that. So it comes from individuals, but it's not an organized effort because you you have to look at a, a Christian that would that would operate that way, that would be somebody who is um, operating out of essentially what God has called them to do, even though they might not necessarily believe it on paper or they haven't been taught it on paper, mm -hmm. but yet they're doing it. And I, I did want to mention this towards the end, but what you do is almost a better indication of what you believe than what you say you believe. Yeah, that's right. What you do James says that clearly. Yeah. <clears throat> what you do shows what you believe. What you don't do shows what you don't believe. 
Exactly. Right. So um, regardless of whether you say it or not. So there's that even in that line, there's that parable where uh, Jesus says that. I think with a son, he says to the mm. son, go work in my vineyard. And the son says, I'll do it. Mm. I'm going to do it. And then he does it. Mm -hmm. And his other son says, I'm not going to do it. But he actually does the work. Right. You know, it's that idea of it's your actions, yeah. not what you say that yeah. counts. And James is clear on yeah. that. If you are not a doer of the word, mm -hmm. and you're only a hearer of the word, you're deceived. Yeah. And you might not even be a Christian. And what do, how do we know what to do? The Bible the tells us God, what yeah. to do. And, you know, and people could say, could argue, oh, well, yeah, but that's, you're interpreting it wrong or this or that. But I mean, hey, we've already attacked in the, in the past the whole idea that the church is antinomian, which means anti-law, mm -hmm. which, so the, the modern evangelical church will say that the law of God does not abide today. Or they'll say, it's not about law, it's about grace, which is a, a grossly reductionistic, right? It reduces yeah. the, the word of God and the, the reality that we live in in God's word down to yeah. a bit into like a little little tip bit or a little point. It's not about law, it's about grace. It was about grace since Genesis 3. Yeah. Right? Same God. But grace to now be able to obey God. Mm -hmm. And how do you obey God? You found out what his law says. Yeah. And yeah. you obey his law willfully from your heart into your actions. Yeah. Right? I think the only change that the Bible really says is, is the indwelling of the Spirit. Right. And the laws would be written on our hearts yeah. when we're indwelt by the Spirit. That's the only real difference that the gospel is worldwide now. It goes mm -hmm. to the Gentile, not to a select mm -hmm. uh, group of people like the Israelites. Yeah. That's the only change. Yeah. So there, there will be some change in the... Uh, in the daily living laws and and the laws pointing to christ sacrificial yeah but overall that nothing has changed it's just yep. spread through the whole we're world we're supposed to rightly divert uh rightly divide yeah the word of truth right so recognizing that a lot of the law points pointed forward to christ yeah now christ has come to fulfill that we look back in remembrance of that's why some of our some of the things that we do within the church have changed um, but for the most part, God's moral law and his ethical law and all of these, you know, civil laws and stuff still still abide today. So we have to rightly divide that. So, yes, I think it would be good if we could take um, I don't know how long we've been, we've been going for 37 minutes wow. and we were potentially running into trouble with having three examples. So let's try to hit these examples in five minutes each. Okay. Right, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my timer. What's the first example? Um, and yeah, I so want to head first, start here. So the first example of how the church has essentially syncretized with the world, how the modern evangelical church, the first example that we want to look at is political correctness Ooh. and free speech. Okay, so let's have a look at that. Um, political correctness. What does that mean? What, what? Why are we getting into trouble here? Uh, well, political correct, correct. I remember when it kind of started coming in. You know, the whole idea that you, uh, some, like it's like a false kindness. Like you wouldn't call people bald. You know, you like follically challenged. You wouldn't mm -hmm. say short people. There's a a nicer word for it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you couldn't say mentally retarded. Because that, that's a derogatory now, mm -hmm. retardation. So mm -hmm. you'd have to say the handicapped. And then that whole idea of, it's almost comes to the point that you're kind of covering up truth. Right. And trying to make it sound a little better. Okay. You know, with, with fancier terms. So culturally, we've changed some meanings of words and that gets yeah. us into trouble already. We're, we're talking about one thing, but the, the person that you're talking to hears something differently because yes. we're not defining the terms correctly. Um, words have but don't have the same meaning or no meaning at all but nowadays. let's take that into specifically into uh, the, the Christian culture one of the things that we've been told before and we've been told this on the streets as we've been out preaching is don't preach that gospel that uh, that the negative side of, of the gospel or the bad news is that man is 
men, men and women everywhere are born in sin and that they're cut off from God's life because of their sin. They're not holy and that there is a God is requiring that they be holy and here's his law in order to follow. But of course, they can't follow it. Right. So you are unable to follow God's law and therefore you'll be judged for that. And obviously, like in the Bible, it talks about eternal judgment if yeah. you won't repent of sin. Mm-hmm. And that we tell people then the good news, which is, is that even though you couldn't obey the law, Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law for you and then transform you so that you can obey him. You can follow him. You can give your life to him and you can live as a new person. Mm. But that's hate speech. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it, secular idea of everybody has their own reality that works for you. Right. You know, you want to live your life that way. You want to worship that way. Right. And that is really in the church mm-hmm. now more and more. Like even with the gay marriage, mm-hmm. transgenderism like that, mm-hmm. you, can, you can see it. That a lot of the leaders in the evangelical church are right. are totally going against the Bible against that because, yeah. you know, how can we judge a transgender person? You know, they even say we have to discuss this more and see where mm-hmm. we're a biblical Christian knows direct rebelling against your yeah. creator, you know? You may have to discuss it some more with the yeah. person, but that discussion equals going to the ultimate point of authority, which is the word yeah. of God. It doesn't mean that we come along as, as Christians, and maybe this is where this whole idea of, harming people has come from is that christians in the past have come along with a fire and brimstone attitude towards people and their sin and focus on the sin rather than on the savior of the sin yeah you can be lopsided in that too right you know but but essentially it's it's essentially harming someone and we've been told this before don't come here preaching that because you're harming those people that you're speaking to and that they're going to then respond negatively by then going to drug addiction more because you've harmed them and hurt them yeah even though even though it's the salve that they need which is the truth which is that they're maybe a drug addict because they have sin issues in their lives yeah and that they um that they self-medicate with drugs or alcohol or whatever else in order to escape right it's a false idol worship that they're going towards and that it's our it's important that we're commanded to actually go out and tell that otherwise the blood's on our hands because christ has given us this message and if we don't share that message regardless of whether the culture likes it or not we stand uh condemned under god we're responsible yeah because and uh, the whole idea is you know of pointing out sin i mean the bible is clear on that we have to uh, put our finger as it were on the sore spot that wound has to be cleaned out and cleansed before it can heal right you know and and we're responsible to point that out and the funny thing is is people think it, it harms them but they don't realize is that they're being convicted because they know that's wrong and um because if we were just talking about Santa Claus or, or something, yeah. they would there would be no conviction. Right. They would just laugh and joke. But as soon as you start speaking about the Creator and, and Christ yeah. and judgment and our accountability to God, right. then people get angry because they get convicted. Right. You know, and that that's a lot a lot of people don't understand. And I think that's why there's so much hatred against uh, true biblical okay. preaching. Yeah. Because sure. of, of yeah. that conviction. It irritates because people know the truth inside, like Romans 1 says. Right. So we've had our five minutes there. So we didn't get anywhere. Well, I think it was a good introduction. Okay. But we, I think what we could say is, is that uh, as a, as an example of how to solve this problem, churches, pastors, Christians in general need to read their Bibles, right? You need to read it a lot. You should be reading the Bible all the time, right? Yes. And recognize what God is saying through the word and recognize that God is commanding all people uh, around the world to repent and obey Christ. Yes. And how do you obey him? Well, his law is given, right? So Christians need to be very clear that instead of worrying about what the culture around how they feel about that, Mm -hmm. 
you know, this might be hate speech or something like that, because that's the, that's the world's label, not ours. It's actually yep. love speech in Christian terms, is to be bold, bold and proclaim the truth of the gospel and to proclaim the negative sanction of someone disobeying God's law, which yep. is ultimately leads to their not only physical death, but their spiritual death. I think the key right. thing, especially for pastors and preachers, is um, you should be speaking, like they, the saying is, as an, an audience of one. Right. Like God. <clears throat> you should be speaking God's words. Right. No matter what the result is. Yeah. Like we shouldn't be saying a message and then worrying about that person's feelings. Right. You know, that, that, that's yeah. not our job. Yeah. Our job is as ambassadors of Christ to speak his words only. Yeah. And, and let and, them be offended at the word of God. Yeah. Not you. Take it up with God. It's right. not our fault. We're just speaking truth from God's word. And, right. and if you don't agree with that, yeah. it's not my fault. Yeah. 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 I definitely, I definitely like, uh, I like that first point and just to be able to like encourage more Christians and more churches to actually preach the word of God. Yeah. Right. And just, and, and leave the results in God's hand, right? Definitely, because it's the Bible says, "Speak the truth in love," right? Right, and the whole Corinthians thirteen talks about the sounding gong and the crashing symbol. Right. I mean, we have to have love, but that doesn't take away the truth part, right? You know, we have to, and I think the key thing is is humbleness, is realizing when you're exposing sin in other people that you understand that you were also a sinner mm -hmm. you were no different than them yeah the only difference is you are now a saved sinner You've received grace yeah and they are an unsaved yep. sinner if yep. they if they mm -hmm. haven't repented yeah but we can't start softening the message right. because of somebody's feelings that that's that's not loving yeah that's evil amen okay so that took us 10 minutes oh, when it was man. supposed to be five so that's okay all right i don't even know what let's, the point was anymore uh, political correctness free speech how is the church back down now the second one here not standing up for justice so this is this is a, a big one here i don't know if you want to find psalm 82 verse 3 and 4 um because we have social issues going on in the world uh we've got obviously in, in in our context, we've got homelessness, drug addiction, alcohol abuse um, with a cross section of society. But we've also got things like passports yeah. and can't abortion. say it out loud. You can't say that we might <clears throat> not even be able to stay on YouTube by saying the word even. But things like that, we don't stand up for justice and uh and we pay the price for it. So why don't you read those two verses from psalm 82 verse 3 give justice to the weak and the fatherless maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute rescue the weak and the needy deliver them from the hand of the wicked right absolutely so for us as christians um we are to be a essentially a very visible or collective ecclesia which uh, the term is a political term. It's a it's a congregation of people. That's a visible congregation of people. They're not inside four walls of a building. They can be, but they're not always there. Mm -hmm. They're in mm -hmm. the public space, and that they're to stand up for justice according to God's law, according to His word. So right now we have this. Um, we have various parts of the world, not all places in the world, but various places mandating that people get a mandating that people get a medical procedure done in order to be able to uh stay as a class a citizen within society let's just put it that way yeah okay we're not talking right now about the vaccine we're not talking about it we're talking about a mandate to get it if you have the vaccine great if you don't great it's your conscience that you have to uh, bear witness to whether you get it or not. But yep. to have a higher power, quote unquote, or a centralized power come and say, you need to take a medical experimental thing in order to stay in society. Christians need to stand up against that biblically as per God's law. Definitely. Right. We're seeing it here in, in Psalm 82. 
Yep. Yep. Right. Um, because, like you say, it's, a, it's just a general mandate. There's no thought for people that have health issues that can't take the vaccine. There's no consideration for people that are already immune. Mm -hmm. Natural immunity mm -hmm. is not considered. And, and that's where it gets ridiculous because mm -hmm. they don't care. Like if you want to go to a store or a restaurant and probably church one of these days, I'm sure and you don't show proof of vaccination, mm -hmm. you'll be denied that, mm -hmm. and you'll be ostracized from society. Right. And, and that, that, is, that is tyranny. And a, a ch I would say that a church going along with a government mandate to look at people's vaccination records or any other medical record at the door of a church building means that your church is captive. Yeah, you're you're just a puppet of the government. Right. So it, definitely it, the church everybody always talks about separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. Well they meant going back that the church didn't do the state stuff. Well now we have the same thing, whereas the, the church is captive to the state, whereas before yeah. the state was captive to the church. So church and state aren't aren't separate, are they? No. When the state says you can and can't do this and that you must obey in these in these ways, and you must um, ask for people's private information at the door. Yeah. Um, no, this doesn't fall in under the sphere of the gov the government's authority, and the church has a right to back down to that. And by God's grace, there are churches around here. Yeah. Uh, even in in, Cal in Calgary, uh, up by Edmonton and other places, passive have been arrested because they wouldn't uh, shut down the church when the government told them to. And good for them. Yes. Good yeah, for them. Because governments are under Christ's authority. We talked about that last last time. Um, the, I was going to say something yeah. else, but I can't remember what. So let's carry on. Well, we're, we've only got about 12 seconds left here, but I'm oh. sure that we can drag it out for another five minutes mm -hmm. after. But uh, let me just turn the alarm off right now because it's going to get annoying. Let's just uh, stop that. Oh, I had one second left. That was close. <laughs> um, uh, I had the privilege of being able to speak at the at a uh, at a rally at city hall last week and um i think there's a video clip of it somewhere but yeah i've seen that but basically um what i had mentioned into to to the group of people that were standing there and not everybody would have been a christian was that there are things that are in society that are wrong and we're recognizing it right now. Obviously, there are people that were, are struggling with, you're literally struggling with this whole mandate thing. You're going to lose your job because of it. You're not, your children aren't gonna be you know, able to do sports or these various yeah. different things. That you're here because it's affecting you or it's about to affect you. But I also said, there are things in culture though, there's many things in culture that aren't right. And we haven't stood up to those things, you know? So mm -hmm. the, one of the biggest ones here is the fact that in Canada, the US, United Kingdom, and many uh, previously Christian nations, um, the ending of a life of an unborn in the mother's womb is completely legal and fine. And, and if we think that vaccine passports is the biggest thing, it isn't. Like we've got way other other worse issues going oh, on that we haven't stood up for. So nope. now vaccine passports and all that stuff, it becomes a little bit more public because it's actually affecting people who are out there alive and yep. you know ready to stand up and use their voices. But Christians ought to be rescuing the weak and needy and delivering them from the hand of the wicked. Well, are Christians not supposed to be standing up against abortion? You know, um, you might not always have an opportunity to do that. Um, we don't like our abortion clinics. We don't even know Canada, where they are. Yeah, we don't know where they are, but we Tucked don't really away. have abortion clinics. They're in many ways they're connected with Alberta Health Service, so that gets into other yeah. issues when it comes to secularized medicine and and the presuppositions behind it that it's not Christian, yep. which we can talk about. But these are the things that we need to stand up for. That essentially we're under this judgment from God right now because we've been aborting babies for so long that uh, that the blood is on our on our soil right and yeah and we can also look at how um, you know indigenous people were treated and stuff over the years 
and how that they were killed and and basically essentially forced into slavery and the blood is on a nation and we're just reaping the whirlwind because of it yeah yeah right and the church needs to stand up to all of these things rather than be just quiet because if you're quiet you're complicit with it when you see evil happening and you say nothing you're giving the thumbs up to evil yep there's plenty of texts in the bible that if you don't uh stand up against you know if you don't stand up against the thief or the one yep. that's cursing then yep. you, you you're in agreement with them, absolutely you know, and that's that's wrong <clears throat> But to go with the 80, Psalm 82 is Isaiah 58, where, where God is explaining true and false fasting. And in, in verse 6, he says, Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? And then it goes on and on about mm -hmm. all these unjustice. And God says that is true religion, right? is doing the work of God and yeah. not... Um, having these rituals right. that you think you're serving, because God talks about it in, in Book of Malachi too. Yeah. You know, you're, you're tithing and you're doing all the outward religious stuff, but basically you're teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Right. You know, and that's that's a false religion. Right. And there's so many churches, vast majority, that don't understand what true religion really is. Right. You know, and that's absolutely scary dangerous so, stuff point one free speech preach the gospel preach the word mm -hmm. whether it's popular or not to all people yes point two Amen. how do we solve that problem stand up against injustice stand up against injustice in yeah. all forms according to god's word what is injustice we know it we know deep yeah. down especially christians you know deep down stand up against injustice and many christians individual christians do churches need to be better at organizing around like actually being a an entity that's visible that's doing that yeah to make a difference and then the last one here is essentially um maybe one of the reasons why uh we're in this mess in the first place three examples of the third example of syncretism is the top-down authoritarianism that you find in churches that resemble the power structure of the world. Okay, so let's start the timer. I, I don't know why, you know, five, it's, it, it, <laughs> it, it forces us to, you know. Yeah, focus, but concentrate. Still, we can. So the top-down authoritarianism in churches resembles the power structure of the world. Jesus was a servant leader. He washed the feet of the disciples. Yeah. Uh, he died for the sins of, of the world. Um, he didn't force people to believe anything. He didn't control. But within our churches, we do find that we have a very top-heavy professional church type of outlook. So most people uh, are quite content with going to church on a Sunday, sitting in a pew, receiving um, whatever it is the pastor has to say, singing some songs, shaking yeah. some hands at the end, and then going home. Whereas the, ch the leaders of the church themselves are busy, they're making all the decisions, the responsibility they seem to think falls squarely on them, and then they would then direct ministry funds and people in various different yeah. directions. Well, you, no, you, we don't want you to do that. We need you to go and do this ministry within the church or, or this, or yes. no, we can't sanction that. And oh, we're not so sure about that. And it's not always biblical. Sometimes it's tradition, sometimes it's emotional. Right, so it's very top down in many yep. ways. And is that the model that Christ has given us? No, he speaks directly against that in mm. uh, Matthew 20, verse 25. Because um, they were, uh, the story is that is the sons of Zebedee wanted to sit on his right hand, on his left hand, the mm -hmm. mother requested that. And then the others were indignant at that. You know, that they were placing themselves above in that sense. And then Jesus said in verse 25, But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercised authority over them. So that's the Gentile, the worldly structure. And then in verse 26, he said, It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. 
even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is our example. Mm -hmm. It's clear to hear, and Peter says it in in his book too, mm -hmm. that same idea as if you want to be uh, the greatest, then you must be a servant. Mm -hmm. It's not telling people what to do. It's doing and showing people right. what to do. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the key difference. And and you you can see if you take that example of with the soup kitchen, you know you you approach the churches with a request for funding, mm -hmm. but that goes to leadership only. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the church knows that request was even given. Mm -hmm. So there's just a few men deciding what to do with that money if they want to give it or not. Whereas there's many people in the congregation that would love to give money, mm -hmm. and they do. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's that shows that authoritative leadership a few men are deciding mm -hmm. what they're going to do and and they're not building the general kingdom mm -hmm. there's no humbling it's no it's our church it's our mm -hmm. kingdom we we have to build our little church here right. and and if we start giving out funds or letting people give out funds right um they're going to lose control right right you, you lose your funding yeah and 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 that's that's just proves the point that it's it doesn't work for God's church because yeah. that's not how God said to do it. No, he Jesus said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then he says you go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, right? And so each Christian has the has a lot of responsibility and yeah. authority given to them. Yes. The church is an entity that's ordained by God obviously to uh to be able to organize to better preach the gospel in society through preaching and and activism based on what the bible says and 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 all of this stuff but those powers will decentralize more and, and more and more responsibility should fall on the believer that's filled with the spirit of god yes whereas in our culture power tends to uh to move up to a singular point Right. Yep. So in a in a let's say a non-Christian business or in a non-Christian government, power starts to centralize at a certain point. I mean, we're we're reaping that benefit, if you like, mm. right now benefit. when it comes to our uh, provincial government. So, you know, and this is, again, talking about the downfall of democracy and all of that. But you vote someone in that is supposed to be your servant. They're supposed to be ministers which means they're supposed to minister to you. Time's up. Or actually, they're supposed to minister to God. Yeah. But there's, but we would understand it of being a minister of the people, but yet they just have a, a whole bunch of power. Like Jason Kenney, apparently he's in trouble because he's, uh, Jason Kenney is our provincial um, premier in, in Alberta. He basically calls the shots. This is Jason Kenney's Alberta, whatever he says goes. Yeah. Right. So power has been centralized there and the church is looking at that in the world and they and okay, well, all right. Yeah, we, we can do that too. And actually, I wonder if the world um, is looking in at the church and saying, well, they centralize power. We're all central. You've got to have yeah. control over the masses somehow. Yeah. Right. Therefore, we will go with a top down structure, not actually trusting in each person to be able to make up the decisions for themselves well, of course in a godless society you pretty much have to have totalitarianism yeah because someone's got to make the rules someone's got to make the rules but in a in a society where we're um we we recognize god a lot more and his laws given it's written on our hearts <clears throat> there's more of a responsibility on the person therefore there's less need for for a, a top-down authoritarianism now shouldn't the church resemble that absolutely should resemble that because this is the one of the pillars of or bastions of 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 uh, God's kingdom is is the church. The church should be completely otherworldly. They should be completely yeah. the opposite of the what the world That's is. That's what he says right here. But yeah, we've syncretized, and we do the exact yeah. same thing in many ways. And and the thing the thing behind it is even that individual responsibility. You go to church to get fed or entertained, but the vast majority of teaching is pleasing right speak smooth things to us and you get a whole society it goes back to point one doesn't it yeah Example immature one, yeah. you get immature christians mm. you know that are feeding on milk mm. and not strong meat mm. the bible's clear about that and mm. if you have immature christians they don't know what to do right right and that's why you need a, a servant type leadership that doesn't worry about their 
their little church here that right. that is functioning but over the the whole world that church right. that you're that you're uh raising up your like training people right it says in in, yeah. in uh i forget where it was but tra training people to do the work of the ministry right that's what our leaders should be doing mm -hmm. and not you know you have to yeah and define the works of the ministry not by our traditions in yes. our modern evangelical church but by what the bible actually says which is again yeah. preach the gospel stand up for justice yeah um that's the key thing we are vastly approaching our maximum ever time we're at an hour I think. we're at over an hour um there's some examples and of course we can explore those or other ones in detail some other time stephen yeah. c perks in his book Baal worship modern ancient and modern he's got examples in there and uh, some of those crossover and some of those are other examples it's really good we're going to link uh, in the description now to finish off here I, I typed this up uh, this morning and just want to kind of use it as a summation here so a simple fact remains although secularists attempt to remove God from the equation and measure all thing by man's reason uh, the idea of deity and religion is inescapable. Okay, so secularists, they have a, they have a God, right? There's a, there's a deity there, right, that they follow. Now, of course, that becomes man. Yep. Um, but your orthodoxy or heterodoxy determines your orthopraxy or heteropraxy. So these are, you know, Greek terms and what do they mean? Yeah. We've, we've looked at them before. A orthodoxy means a correct or right belief. Yeah. So your orthodoxy determines your orthopraxy, which is what you do, a correct action. Yep. Okay, And heterodox, obviously, is if you have a, a, a wrong view, like a wrong um, belief, mm -hmm. then it's going to lead to your actions being flawed. Okay. Right. So, um, so don't look at what people say, like a pulpit or someone that preaches on Sunday, what they say is not necessarily what they believe. How can you tell what they believe if they say it and then you see them doing it, then you, then you see what they truly believe, right? So don't look at what people say, look at what they do. The modern evangelical church has been taken away by a false god, as in secular humanism. It has syncretized its worship practices of the true God with the practices of the false religion. And, it's, and in many ways has been overcome by it. Mm -hmm. You can observe from the mystical worship. Oh, sorry about that. You can observe from the mystical worship experience what happens privately on a Sunday morning in a church worship service versus how it actually goes out to impact the world around it. Yeah, it doesn't. No, really, it stays for the most in part. The building. Absolutely. So there's a mystical worship experience where you get to live out what you believe in the confines of the church structures and traditions in the building mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you're you're living out what you understand god's king to be inside the church but it doesn't escape the four walls of the building that's the problem right so god is pouring out new wine right this is what he's doing this is what he's always doing the kingdom of the lord jesus is always progressing forward in history that sounds very woke very progressive mm. right because this is what the, the, the modern secularists will actually say is that we need to move forward yeah. in this world and progress society forward. And of course, we as, as post-millennial Christians, believing that God's law abides today, that we would agree with that. But we would disagree that you can do it without God. The secularists yes. will say, we don't need God. Actually, it's important that we don't have God. He's the one that holds us back. That's what they're progressing away from. Right. So they're they progressing think. away from God, but they think that they're progressing society forward, but actually it brings it backwards. Yeah. Don't realize it because they're blinded by that. But we as Christians truly need to recognize that Jesus is always progressing history forward and his kingdom is expanding. But the model, modern evangelical church isn't going along with it. Christianity is no longer public truth and secular humanism dominates the cultural landscape. So the, the church is essentially captive and resigned to private and mystical worship services to a God that they barely know anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this, this, is where the, this is where it might hurt when you say yeah. something like that to you know, modern, not all modern Christians, but to modern churches in many ways is that 
have you mixed worship of the world with worship of the one true God and now you it barely resembles uh, the truth anymore? Yeah, that's uh, and, and Paul says, examine yourself to see if you are in the truth. You know, we should steady be examining ourselves and then the Bible is full of that too of, of making sure you're worshiping God properly. Right. You know, you can go to Isaiah, Isaiah 1, Jude talks about it. Mm-hmm. We should be doing Worshipping God, how God wants to be worshipped, because mm-hmm. he would know best. Mm-hmm. And there's even that text, you know, you thought you were just like me, mm. you know, but you're not. Mm. We're not We're not like God, you know, and, and yeah. you can see how easy we, we're in, influenced by cultural yeah. society. And if we're not firmly grounded on the word of God, it's easy just to make yeah. up your own religion eventually, yeah. which is essentially... That's what we're talking about. We have our consciences. Man-made. Even as Christians, we would say we have our consciences. But if our consciences aren't tethered or tied to the word of God, like a rudder tied to the, what do you call that spinny thing <laughs> on a boat? The wheel. The ship's wheel. Yeah. Okay. That's what it's called, all Steering you Navy wheel. guys. I should know this. My grandfather was in the <laughs> Royal Navy. But uh, but if you're if you're conscience isn't tied to the word of god um the word of god is that wheel spinning and it's not tied to that rudder you're you're not going to go in the right direction no so it's time to get into your bibles again i I would say it's time for another exodus right it's time for a second reformation but it's more of an exodus we've got to we've got to come out of the old traditions and the old way of worshiping or what we think is worship and we need to ground ourselves more biblically you'll never reform it no i think stephen mentioned that too he said you you just have to the catholic church still exists yeah right and in many ways it's worse than it was even during the reformation times yeah and uh and now the the reformed church um there's a stephen has a new book coming out which i'm really excited about but he basically said is that within the book is that the reformation church reformed the theology but it didn't reform the methodology no. it didn't outwardly change much right it cleaned up the theology yeah but it didn't change outwardly what we're supposed to be doing what god calls us to to tra- to go to the ends of the earth right to bring the and what that means to bring god's kingdom to the ends of the earth and even what is god's kingdom yeah this is it. We're in it. Yeah. <laughs> we got to start living like we're citizens of it. Yeah. Right? The true citizens. And it's time for the church to wake up. Yes, we need mature Christians. Right. That are, you know, feeding on, on the word of God. Strong meat. And mature Christians in, in leadership positions at churches, pointing people to the word of God and, yeah. and serving them and, and going out to, to show the way to go rather than tell and not yeah. actually do it so okay so uh we could probably look at this again in the future we'll see what yeah. type of feedback we well get. it all ties together yeah you know what we're talking about yeah sphere sovereignty even the, everything we've talked about it yeah there's problems in in the church and mm-hmm. if the church doesn't reform mm-hmm. society is really lost yeah if the, if the church doesn't speak out Yes, we. I've been reading through uh, Nehemiah and Esther and Ezra and this time where the, the Jewish people are coming out of exile again. And what was the very first thing that they rebuilt? Temple. It was the temple. For a while. Before the walls went up, before the cities got, re- the towns got rebuilt and all the houses got rebuilt. The first thing is, is that the temple needed to rebuilt be rebuilt so in order for us to reform society or transform society is is better put the church needs to be rebuilt yeah under god and under his individual christians individual christians and and leading to the collective of the church right we need to be rebuilt and the the bible says it over and over that that idea of coming out Mm -hmm. you know it says in isaiah revelation come out from her if 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 you don't think your church is biblical anymore mm-hmm. it's time to come out yeah it's just the way it is yeah you you you're, you're not going to change it yeah you never will yeah you have to come out yeah. and and do what's right yeah and that's, that's a difficult difficult thing that's a tough pill to swallow yep 
it's hard another it's pill that's not so tough to swallow is the orange pill so bitcoin uh you know hey leather if you need right. some leather you want to pay with bitcoin get into bitcoin this is the way to go okay yeah. so i uh, will thank you for our sponsors right so definitely um, yeah okay well let's round it off and say uh what you do, do our thing yeah do your thing and thank you for watching well you haven't we haven't done the whole thing yet we've got to oh. welcome well not welcome thanks for watching the post yeah. mode podcast yeah. With Scott and Pete. Right. Peace. Peace out, you say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. See you next time. See you later. Yeah.